Good morning and welcome to Over the Target. I'm Lee Smith. Thank you for joining us this morning. We have a terrific show with Amber Athey. Amber is the Washington editor of The Spectator and also author of a great new book, The Snowflakes Revolt, How Woke Millennials Hijacked American Media. There it is. Go out and get it. Go out and read it. And I know you're going to want to after our Great conversation here with the marvelous Amber Athey. Amber, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, so the book, I mean, the, 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 title, uh, the title is descriptive. The title puts us right in the middle of it. <laughs> what's happening, uh, what's happened to our press ha has a lot to do with it. Who's taken charge of it? And of course, across the board, we're worried about woke millennials, um, taking control of the justice system, of course, taking control of our political parties. And we've seen a lot of this happening, but I think a lot of people don't understand the actual uh, details and how this happened to the media. We've um, different press uh, virtues and different press processes have been overrun the last several years um, by woke millennials. H how did that happen? I think a big part of the issue can be traced back to the professionalism or the professionalization of journalism. So journalism used to be a working class profession. It was filled with blue collar folks who otherwise didn't have higher education. Most of them were high school graduates or below. Well, in the mid 1900s, uh, the reporters got obsessed with the idea of objectivity, which on its face is a good thing. But they decided that the only way you could prove you were objective is if you went to an elite Higher, inst uh, higher education institution or if you went to journalism school. Well, over time, of course, these institutions became incredibly liberally biased thanks to just the nature of academia and the type of people who were willing to become professors and the types of people who were doing research. So pretty much every journalist that has been hired at major media outlets, especially the corporate ones, over the past 70 to 80 years has come from one of these liberal higher ed colleges. And so that's how you end up with this class of journalists who tends to come from wealthier backgrounds than the average American, tends to be more likely to come from a city, has parents that were white collar employees as opposed to blue collar. People are more likely to come from the coast. Uh, it's basically become a big echo chamber. And most recently, the millennial generation, which has been more progressive and radical than ever, um, has been able to exercise a lot of influence on the media because, of course, they've been growing in number, but they also use different tactics than liberals before them. They believe in mob justice. They believe in public shaming campaigns, and they don't believe in free speech or the ability of uh, smart people to have discourse and to understand the concerns of people who disagree with them. So that's how you've seen this illiberal shift in the media to where debate is shuttered, people who dissent are kicked out, and there's only one view being represented in the media. I think for a lot of outsiders, that was best illustrated. I mean, and of course, this is still inside media stuff, but it was best illustrated with the... the um, the noise over Senator Tom Cotton's op-ed for the New York Times and the younger generation at the Times revolted. And of course, that was how the op-ed uh, op page editor lost his job. So I guess that's how people um, that's how people have some sort of window into this. Can I ask, did, did you go to journalism school? I did not. So I did go to one of those good, good institutes. Tree. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> I, I <laughs> did go to, to one of those elite institutions, yeah. though. I got my undergraduate degree from Georgetown. And uh -huh. in the first uh, third of the book, I actually write about my experience there. And hmm. it gave me a lot of insight into this millennial generation in terms of the progressives who are in it and hmm. just the way that they think. I was a very outspoken hmm. conservative on campus, and I was the target of a lot of this hatred. Um, I was reported to the administration multiple times for allegedly creating an unsafe environment for my peers. I was reported to my RA because I had the gall to advertise for a gun club with a poster on my freshman year <laughs> dorm room door. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. I filed multiple police reports at my time there because of online threats. Wow. And it was okay. it was wild. Um, just yeah. I would express the most anodyne right wing opinions <laughs> and leftists on campus would have a meltdown and they would try to do anything to shut me up. And I saw them, of course, use the same tactics against the administration. And the administration 
it was not, you know, boldly, brashly conservative. So they would go along with right. whatever these people wanted because they were terrified of the accusations of bigotry and racism and whatever else the left mm -hmm. would throw their way. And you would think that the adults in the room at corporations and major media outlets would learn that lesson of what's been happening on campus, but they have not. And still no one really uh, in terms of newsroom leadership has been willing to stand athwart the mob and say, stop enough. Why? Pe people have people have, have tried to explain this to me and I'm a little dense, but they've said, well, look, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the the fact that the financial model of the press has changed somewhat once they moved away from, well, once it was very hard to get advertisements uh, for the press, um, whether that was classified advertising or retail or, uh, you know, the financial model changed and became more dependent on subscriptions since they really had to cater to the, you know, to the, not only the taste, but the whims of a younger generation. So is that why senior management won't put its foot down in cases like the New York Times episode? It's like, well, actually we have, this is how our subscribers think too. The young people here who are going crazy on, what's the name of the, the, the internal chat line at the, at the New York Times Slack. Yeah. I is that the what it is? Activists in the book. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But, but yeah, that's part of it. But I, mm -hmm. I think that these legacy institutions vastly overestimate how many of their subscribers agree with what these journalists wow. are doing internally. Um, because the idea that every New York Times subscriber or the vast majority of them are the illiberal left, I just don't think is wow. accurate. But this is happening more aptly for a couple of reasons. One is that the newsroom leaders are mostly baby boomers who don't understand social media. So they mm. see a few tweets or a few Facebook comments mm. and they freak out. They don't know how to handle it mm. because to them, a few tweets is a mm. major PR crisis. So <laughs> right. they it, repre it represents a quarter of a million readers. And so exactly. they melt down like, oh my. Yes, and they overcorrect. Mm. And then the other problem is that of course, these newsroom leaders are liberal. They're just not right. liberal or left leaning in the same way that the radical progressives, the wokes are. And so they're kind of sympathetic to the cause. They're more mm. likely to maybe be amenable to what these people are offering, to what they're saying. But they're also terrified of the accusations of racism. A liberal mm. baby boomer to them being called a racist is the worst thing in the world, right? right? That is the worst reputational yeah, yeah. thing that could happen to them. And so they will do anything to avoid that. They don't understand that these accusations of bigotry because they've been thrown around so willy nilly by the woke millennials and Generation Z, they don't really mean anything anymore. To them, it's still a, a huge life ending charge. Right. Well, so how is this affecting? Um, I, I mean, I, the, the media is, has long been liberal. All right. I mean, I, 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 my, my, my father was a journalist. My uh, great grandfather, my grandfather is involved in the in, in the media. My great grandfather was uh, was a, a typesetter at the New York Daily News. So I know that the, the 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 press has long been liberal, but this is an entirely. Well, I think you're saying that this is an entirely different thing now because the liberals on top don't quite understand what the woke generation is doing uh, or what their goals are underneath. So. To ask an obvious question, how is this affecting how is this affecting the prestige news organization's coverage of events? It's affecting every aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the reason that you see people like Barry Weiss and Glenn Greenwald, who would be described as liberal, leaving these papers mm -hmm. is because they don't feel that they're allowed to do journalism anymore. I think it's fair to say that even when the papers were liberally biased, they still somewhat sought to represent both sides of an issue. They wanted to talk to Republicans. They wanted to attempt to present the conservative side. I don't think they did it very well, but I think they tried. Well, now you're not even allowed to present the other side at all because you'll be accused of both sidesism. That's what the woke millennials <laughs> refer to as objectivity or uh, striving to be unbiased. Uh -huh. Both sides of them oh. because they believe that they have a monopoly on truth. And if you dare to represent what a conservative or a Republican is saying, then you are uh, willfully advancing lies. Um, that's truly what they believe. So this uh, is changing coverage in uh, I'll give you a couple of, of examples to illustrate the point. So at Politico, there was a reporter there by the name of Gabby Orr. And she uh, was is a very good journalist. She's not in journalism anymore, but very, very talented. 
And she wrote an article a couple of years ago about how Republicans were using the transgender issue as a wedge midterm issue. So basically, um, heading into the midterms, conservatives were talking about protecting women's sports and advancing legislation to that effect. It was a very fair article. She quoted people on both sides of the issue. But after it was published, she was called into a struggle session with the uh, editor of diversity initiatives by the name of Robin Turner and several of her colleagues who had complained about the article. And their complaints were that the article did not properly contextualize the comments made by conservatives as transphobic. And the comments by conservatives were from Stephen Miller, the former White House aide, and Terry Schilling, president of the American Principles Project. And their quotes basically just talked about the issue in the way any conservative would. Um, these colleagues were mad that Gabby did not expressly say that their comments were transphobic. They also accused her of not quoting any quote unquote transgender voices, even though she had extensively quoted Kate Oakley, who is a representative for the human rights campaign. So although she's not transgender, of course, she was speaking on behalf of the transgender lobby and their interest. Um, Gabby was actually offered at the end of that meeting to have sensitivity readers go through all future articles about transgender issues to make sure that she didn't make this grave error of quoting conservatives ever again. And she left Politico not long after. Um, but what followed was Politico actually releasing an entirely new style guide that banned all gender lang gendered language in the newsroom. And as of a couple of months ago, after the book was released, they gave an update to that style guide that now requires every reporter who's writing on transgender issues to have their article combed over by yeah. a sensitivity reader prior to publication. Are there any of the journalists at these publications where this stuff is going on? Are there any people who are uh, who are who are bucking this or saying, uh, you know, well, I mean, it's hard to fight it, but are any of them saying, I can't believe we're going through this. This is not this is not why my parents spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to send me uh, to send me to a Columbia journalism school. Or are they all like, <laughs> yeah, this is good. Now we're all on the same page. What's the what's the response of, of, of younger journalists to this? Yeah, is anyone saying this is garbage? There's a lot of people who are silently doing it or anonymously yeah. doing it, but they're equally as scared that they will lose their job or that they will be pushed out by the woke mob if they don't comply with what's happening. So a lot of times they'll have low level conversations with their editor about some of their concerns. They'll try to slip things into their articles that might otherwise be nabbed by a wokester if they were to see it. But for the most part, wow. because the, the media is made up of so many of these woke millennials now and also just left-leaning liberals who are so scared of them, there's not really a big group that's pushing back. And again, that's why you see one by one some of these old school liberals leaving for independent media and even conservative media. Really? Like who are the ones, I mean, can you, can you name the different people who've gone over to conservative media? Because I, mean, I, I, I you're in Washington, right? Your editor of the editor of the spec Washington editor of the spectator there. And I know, and, and when I was living in Washington, this was uh, something that we would see all the time. We would see a young person, young, young man, young woman, they would come to uh, Caitlin Collins as someone who comes, you know, who comes immediately to mind. Someone who starts off in conservative media and uses that as a launching pad to go on to, you know, uh, left wing, i.e., state media, whatever we want to call it. So you're saying that there are some people who are actually going the other way. Can uh, who are you thinking of? Yeah, I can name a couple of names, but some of them mm -hmm. probably would prefer to be anonymous. Yeah. But okay. Susanna. Lu um, she was at Politico covering mm. health uh, issues, and now she's at the Washington Free Beacon mm. as of, I believe, a few months ago. Um, Sarah Westwood started her career at the Washington Examiner and then went to CNN, so a similar trajectory as Caitlin mm. Collins, but then returned to the Washington Examiner after a short time at CNN. Um, and there's more, too, that I can't really say at, at this time, mm. but um, I think that people are starting to realize that Conservative media is not this, um, you know, biased extension of the Republican Party like left wing media mm -hmm. is. And there's a, a striving for truth that doesn't exist in so much of the rest of the media. Wow. Well, I mean, that's good news for, uh, you know, whether we want to call it right wing media or in some cases dissident media. Um, 
great conversation with Amber Athey. We're going to cut away for uh, a little less than a minute here. If you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube, please make the jump exclusively to Epoch TV. When we come back, we're only going to be on Epoch TV. And you want to make the jump because you don't want to miss a single second of our great conversation with the marvelous Amber Athey. See you in a sec. Were they actively controlling information? But if you remember back, New York Times was running those fluff pieces on the invasion of Iraq. And I forget the reporter's name, the gal who was doing that. It turned out that she was just being managed or handled by Department of Defense senior officials and kind of backing the lie about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That's a great example of how the government and some of these agencies and, and departments in Washington were able to control the narrative and control the information. Fantastic background on how the disinformation regime, the censorship consortium came to be. And essentially, getting them to support something that if they knew the truth, they wouldn't support at all.